Welcome to the Fire Sprinkler Podcast with Chris and Logan. SprintCAD for Revit, now with fabrication tools. Quickly generate complete branch lines with arm overs, sprigs, or drops. Connect heads to branches, generate heads on runs, or pipes to pipe with any desired fitting, even on sloping pipes. Design, calc, fabricate. SprintCAD. Hey everybody, thanks for tuning into this episode of the Fire Sprinkler Podcast. On this episode, I have Rob Smith from JCI. Rob is a SprintCAD would you call yourself a guru? What would you call yourself in regards to the SprintCAD uh, software? I wish I wish I were a guru. Uh, I'm, <laughs> I might be in the position of directing a lot of what happens. Okay. But uh, that doesn't mean I understand it. I just I try to explain to programmers what I want to happen. I try to listen to customers to understand what they want to happen. Right. What is your position at uh, JCI? Uh, title is Senior Software Analyst, which basically means that I try to take apart the processes, put things down on paper in a way that programmers can understand exactly what we want to happen. So if, uh, if you click on a button and you want a certain thing to pop up and you want it to do something, I have to try to describe that. That's right. my primary role. I also back up the technical support group uh, as needed, but generally speaking, they, they know what they're doing and they do a good job. Uh, and then I do listen to customers. We've got uh, opportunities now and again to sit and listen to input from people. In fact, I'll put in a plug right now that anybody that goes to that springcad.com website, there is a sales demo button. You can't miss it up on the top right, big orange thing. And if you click that and, and you can see instructions on how to send us an email, tell us what you need. You know, I really right. wanna know what people need out of Revit so that we can move in that direction. So the topic of the conversation today is gonna to be Sprint CAD for Revit. Um, we're gonna kind of see how, the pro how you go from, you know, the software that was around 10, 15 years ago and even pen and paper from uh, lines and circles to drawing a 3D product. And uh, I've done other episodes in the past with other 3D design software and uh, kind of gauging my interest on which softwares are out there and uh, using the podcast to my advantage as a very in-depth sales pitch. So I, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> like I've said, I, I always, I, I've always said I do this podcast uh, in a very greedy way manner where i get to talk to some of the smartest sprinklers uh sprinkler people yeah. in the industry and uh <laughs> somebody here that i didn't know about no. yeah <laughs> like yourselves the uh the software analyst um that's a that's a that's a title i've never heard before that's good you might be the first <laughs> software analyst i've had on the podcast um anyways why don't you uh why don't you kind of why don't you kind of bring up the software and show us how it works all right so this is in Revit 2022. Uh, we support 2019 through 2022. And uh, I, I would say that, you know, first off, I'm a software analyst. I am not a Revit guru. Uh, we, we came into the whole Revit world with a whole lot of AutoCAD experience under our belts and not a heck of a lot of Revit experience. And so we kind of dove into this saying, what what don't we like about Revit? And mm -hmm. the, to be truthful, there was a lot, a lot of things that we just didn't like about Revit. And it, I think that's true for anybody that has AutoCAD background. Right. Um, so a lot of what we did, we, we tried to incorporate uh, things that we knew how to do, things that we thought an AutoCAD user would be comfortable with. So, for example, um, some of the stuff I'm going to demonstrate right now, it doesn't matter what view you're in. Top view, uh, any one of the Revit floor plans, ceiling plans, etc. If you can see the pipe, 
then you can work on the pipe. Okay. So we've got a SprintCAD toolbar. Uh, the BIM port command has been around forever. This was our initial foray into Revit where we let AutoCAD users who drew in SprintCAD create fire sprinkler systems and then export them into a special file that this piece of software, BIMport, will read. And it'll literally build a Revit model in Revit using all Revit parts. But it's your design from, from the AutoCAD side. Now, I'm not going to bother showing you that. We've also got this family manager. And the family manager's purpose is to help you create Revit families from content such as we've got, you know, sprinkler content, fittings, pipe, mechanical outlets, welds, hangers, valves. You don't have to know how to build families. You just come in here and pick uh, an item that you want to build and say, well, I want to, I need to build this alarm valve, groove by groove, etc. And you go pick one or more that you want included in that family. Because as you probably know, a family can include many types as long as they share, share common parameters. So you can go in and you can create a family of something like an alarm valve without really knowing anything about creating families. So that's that's a really cool tool for somebody who comes into Revit sprinkler design not really knowing that much about. Then we have simple tools like this jog pipe around. Uh, jog pipe around allows you to take, I'm looking at the wrong space, uh, I could take like this sloping pipe here. I'll make a copy of it just so. Yeah, so the, what he's doing right now on the screen for anybody that's oh. listening to the audio version Sorry. is uh, he's just taking a simple pipe drawing that he's got in the Revit, uh, in his Revit model. Um, and he's, he's kind of showing the different tools that are on there right now. So, so right now right. we're going to do the jog around tool. Uh, explain what the jog around tool does automatically. So what it what it's basically doing is it's allowing you to establish uh, an angular offset. I, I need to roll out at 45 degrees, or or I need to go up 90 degrees relative to you know vertical. I need to go up in the air, go over something, and come back down. But okay. maybe maybe you know that you need to go up two feet and over three foot four inches in order to get right into that space that you're shooting for as you slip past some piece of equipment well then you don't have to know the angles you simply plug into the system that fact that i want to go up two feet and i want to go over what did i say three foot four inches three foot four yep and the program calculates the angle for you and tells you what that offset distance is or in this top part of this dialogue that I'm showing, you could say, well, I want to go 45 degrees and I want to, I want to go three feet. So either way, you can describe the offset and the distances. And then you can pick your start and end points, or you can specify from the end of the pipe, go this many feet, and then make my offset go this many feet further, and then return back down to the original. So uh, I'm going to use that aspect of it here. I'll say go out two feet and come up five feet. So I just pick somewhere near the end of the pipe, and the program makes this offset for me. Does it? So that'll right. do any kind of angle up, over, and down at a certain angle. It, essentially, you're doing a rolling yeah. offset 45 for any fitters that are listing right now. Exactly. Um, and and does yeah. the kind of the leg work for you now? And and the beauty of that is that even if that's a sloping pipe, the program is understanding what it does on the slope, relative to the slope. And everything that we implement like that, the program thinks in terms of center to center distances the way fire sprinkler people do. Mm -hmm. Revit has a tendency to think end of, end of pipe to end of pipe, plus you've got this fitting takeout. But our tools work from center to center uh, so that everything is, you know, the way we tend to think as, as designers. Right. And so fitters. that's just, and fitters, that's right. Yeah. That's just one tool. I come from a design background. I started on the board back in 1980. So it's, it, I, for all the fitters out there, my apologies, but that's, yeah. that's my background. 
Well, um, the, the the thing that I'm trying to do with the podcast is get the uh, the the fitters and the designers to kind of yes. think similarly, similarly, similar, and uh, and kind of understand that we're all in the same. We're all in this together. Like as much yeah. as everybody butts heads in the industry, sprinkler and design, like in the field and, and designers, like we all have to work together for the same common goal, right? And that's protect property and life. Absolutely. It's kind of like in the movie Oklahoma where the sheep herders and the cowmen need to be friends. Yeah. <laughs> Haven't seen the movie. Writing it down. That'll be tonight's goal. Oh, yeah. Well, that's that's an oldie. <laughs> that, that shows my age. Um, so another tool that we have, uh, I'm not going to say along the same lines, but it, it works whether you're dealing with uh, sloping pipe or, or not is the sprinklers on pipe tool. Okay. So I'm able to pick a family. Now these families are basically exist in, in my system, uh, whether uprights or pendants, and I can pick a type out of that family. And then I basically, I'm going to take this out and say none right here. Uh, and I'm going to go two feet from the start of the pipe, and every 12 feet, I'm going to drop a sprinkler head. Okay. Uh, and I'll say along the entire run, I get options like, you know, do you want to do the full length or not? And I, I pick that pipe, and the program's going to drop these sprinkler heads along that pipe. Now, if you're doing something like that and you've already done a rolling offset on it, will it take that rolling offset into consideration? Can it take the rolling offset into consideration, or is it? for a length of pipe it is for a length of pipe it understands basically a, a run of pipe um or if if the rolling offset happened in the middle of a run it could actually jump across the rolling offset but it doesn't go around and follow through the elbows and and things like that okay uh so basically what it did and i'll zoom in here is it stuck a sprinkler head onto the bottom of this pipe and what you're seeing on on the screen here, again, go to the YouTube video because you're seeing the product, that, which is you're seeing a, you're not just seeing a line in a circle like a drawing, like a typical drawing is now. You're you're looking at a sprinkler attached to the bottom of a piece of pipe, which is awesome. And it's a pipe alette, and it mm -hmm. did not break the pipe. I mean, these are true taps. So um, we we use actual taps, actual mechanical tees. Uh, we can, you know, do this as a threaded system. We could do it as a mechanical system. This yep. particular operation is responding to Revit uh, routing preferences. So the, the pipe type that you see here, uh, Schedule 40 pipe threaded, uh, it calls for welded outlets in the routing tables. Okay. And, and I want to bounce off of that concept of routing tables to, to say that, you don't have to understand routing tables to use our program. That was that tool I just showed you was was kind of an early tool that we implemented. I, I think it's really helpful, and, and uh, I could just as easily do uh, sprig ups using the same mm -hmm. tool. And I can specify what kind of pipe that sprig up will be. Some people want to do those with uh, Dynathread, or, or some people would say uh, it might be a Dynathread branch line, but I'm going to use Schedule 40 drops, you know, for the strength, etc. Uh, that's all entirely up to you, because as you saw from the dialogue, I'll just pop that back up. I'm able to choose, especially when it comes to something like my uh, sprigs, what kind of pipe I want to run. So uh, you see, there's various, you know, Schedule 10, Schedule 40. A JCI pipe that we've created at some point, et cetera. Hmm. Uh, and, and all of our tools, and the next one I'll show, deal with that kind of um, what kind of pipe do you want right here? And even if you don't know anything about routing tables, you can use standard items uh, in order that everything you draw is really based i'm going to switch back over to a, a course view for a second so you can see where the sprinkler heads are um, i'm going to run the sprinklers to pipe well, actually i'll run sprinkler to pipe biggest difference between these two is when i do sprinkler to pipe i can specify where does this arm over tie into my branch line so okay. Go so ahead. What we're, 
yeah, what we're looking at now is an is another tool, uh, sprinkler to pipe, which on the screen right now he's showing sprinklers that are in that looks like he he possibly uh, used some sort of an array tool to arrange the sprinklers into the room. Mm -hmm. Did a pipe layout possibly due to ductwork or something like that. It's a little off center of the sprinklers, not straight off the bottom, not six inches, whatever. And and this tool is going to do what now? So I'm basically going to connect those sprinkler heads back to this branch line. Okay. And I can either do so with a single in intervening pipe, as in a, a straight sprig or a drop, or I can use an arm over and a drop or a sprig. These are drawn as drops, but elevation wise, you can go up or down. Mm -hmm. So the idea here is I need two pieces of pipe between my sprinkler and my branch line, uh, the sprig drop and an arm over, or you can go all the way over uh, to a three pipe solution, uh, the, the up, over, down, um, gooseneck. gooseneck, yeah. Yep. So, and, uh, and in all three of these cases, you'll notice uh, if you're looking at the video that we, we label the drop as A, the primary arm over as B. And if you have that third piece to rise up or drop down out of the branch line first, that's piece C. And so each of those segments has the ability to pick a specific type of pipe and a diameter. So, okay, so if you have to rise up with inch and a quarter, over with inch and a quarter, down with one inch, if you have, say, a large orifice sprinkler or something and, and not straight water, you have the ability to adjust that. Absolutely, yeah. So, so, and and I'm going to use these standard pipe types in order to drive home a point. Uh, let me just double check what I'm doing here. The the vertical offset. Okay, so that last piece, because I'm in the three pipe solution, I mm -hmm. have to specify. What's the elevation change between the arm over and the branch line? And do oh. I and do I want that arm elevation change to be relative to the branch line or relative to the sprinkler? So if you had a condition uh, as I've seen back in, in my design days where I needed to rise up out of the ceiling a very specific distance and hit that zone that was assigned to me and then arm over to a to my branch line location and then pop up into the branch line. That's what I would call a down over and down, which is kind of right. common in, in some office conditions, hospitals and things like that. That allows you to say, well, I want to do, it doesn't matter what the elevation of my branch line is now. I want that arm over to be exactly X inches above my sprinkler head. So you can hit that zone that was assigned to you for making the, the arm over. Mm -hmm. Or typical gooseneck situation, I'm just going to go one foot up out of my branch line, as you see here. And then I got this little checkbox that says connect to a point on the pipe. The difference is when I use this, the program doesn't just assume a perpendicular arm over. So you'll see that when I then I pick a sprinkler head and I can pick anywhere along this branch line. So, you know, sometimes in those, uh, let's call it a retrofit condition or whatever, you know where the outlets are supposed to be on your branch line and you've got to get to them in order yep. to relocate those heads. So that's what we've got going on right there. I'm just going to swing that around so you can see what it did. Now if, go ahead. Right. So what we're looking at right now is we're looking at a uh, an arm over or a, a, a break or whatever you want to call it, your terminology, that instead of coming up and in, in perpendicular to the sprinkler piping um, is on an angle to an existing outlet. So if you're doing a retrofit or something like that, existing branch lines or existing outlets are being utilized for that situation. You can use those same outlets as drawn on the in your drawing and design. All right. So. So similar command, uh, except when I use this sprinklers to pipe, or if I didn't use that little checkbox that, that I did a moment ago, it's basically the same interface. Much of the information is identical, but I'm not able to pick specific points on a pipe because the program's going to let me pick multiple sprinklers all at once mm -hmm. and then pick the branch line. So that means it has to stay perpendicular. That's the only uh, real point of that.
Right. And then in, in this case, it gives me a little report when I'm done as to how many it created. And I should have done it down over down. But as you can see, you know, the sprinkler is there and the pipe basically does what we expected. Everything here was that standard pipe type, except for the original that was drawn. Um, and all of the connections were made using this real basic pipe routing table, which we implement in our template so that you don't have to worry about that either. And the advantage here then is if I, if I say to the program, okay, I'm gonna place a start tag. Now I'm using a command called place start tag. And what it does is it establishes where the pipe begins from a fitting makeup point of view. Okay. All right, because everything that we do, if you're thinking fabrication, which is the, the major aspect of our tool that was uh, released here most recently was the fabrication piece. The program needs to know direction of makeup. I'm starting here and I'm going that way. So I just placed on this little system a, a marker. I'm gonna also grab a hold of these pipes and say, you guys are branch lines. So on screen, you see a little drop down that shows things like indeterminate, which is the unknown state. And then we have main, branch, rise nipple, underground, arm over. Sprint CAD is very um, aware of the difference between a main and a branch line in terms of how we number uh, a system. You know, right. mains tend to go A, B, C, D, E, branch lines go one, two, three, four, five, et cetera. And arm overs and sprigs and drops come into play with, with other logic. So I'm just gonna basically say to all these pipes, you guys are branch lines. That allows me to more easily take this next step where I come in here and say, I wanna do a material summary. I pick any one of these pipes and the program says, okay, I found a bunch of stuff. So up on screen right now is this mapping dialog. All right, so, so long road to a small point. By letting us draw using just pretty much any pipe, and by the way, this will work with uh, anybody's uh, Revit piping systems, as long as they're fire protection pipes. You go in and say to the program, well, you know, I drew this many of something. The program knows the nominal diameters of these pipes and the quantity and their names. And I can say, well, that is schedule 40 inch and a half for me. And that is schedule 41 inch for me. Okay. So by, by identifying it this way, we lock down a couple of different things. For hydraulic purposes, we now know the C factor for wet and dry. We know the internal diameters, uh, the smoothness, et cetera. We also are nailing down what kind of fittings I expect to get. And that's based on SprintCAD strategies. So SprintCAD strategies allow you to set up a set of rules that say, if I'm scheduled 10 pipe, I basically want grooved elbows and grooved tees, unless I'm doing you know, a certain connection type, in which case I want a mechanical uh, grooved outlet. And uh, I want all the outlets for my rise and nipples and branch lines to be pipe outlets. Okay. You know, uh, and so all of those decisions are being made automatically by the program. So I'm gonna pick a sprinkler head. These are pendant heads, so I'll just do a quick search on all the pendants and I'll pick one uh, It's a brass pendant head and say proceed. So the program gives me a material summary. So I'm popped up a dialogue that says, okay, look, you've got five of these one by half thread reducers. You got 10 uh, threaded 90s, one inch ductile iron. You've got the uh, reducer fittings, et cetera, et cetera, right. pipes and sprinklers. And when I say close and say, do you want to update the model? So this is the point at which we move beyond just show me my current material summary and take this drawing that I'm processing and make it look like my actual fittings. And the program says, hey, there's a there's a family that you need that doesn't exist in this model. It's the one and a half by one and a half by one ductile iron reducer outlet thread T. So I say, yeah, I wanna make it. You remember I showed you that family builder previously. Mm -hmm. 
that thing just fired off automatically and made this fitting. It just made you a, a it just made you a fitting. It made me a fitting family. And now okay. it's telling me that it's going to replace certain things that are in my drawing and I say okay. And so now if I zoom in on things instead of those temporary uh fittings that you saw before, we've got actual threaded fittings, threaded elbows, looks like a piece uh, pipe reducer coupling. Yeah, yep. it looks like the real thing. Yeah. So, and it's got, you know, you've got part numbers and the whole nine yards. And if if we did a different kind of a system, uh, or if I changed the diameter of these pipes, uh, told that it was scheduled 10 pipe, I could get mechanical tees out of this or pipe alettes, et cetera. Can you go to the point where you're adding, like I noticed when you zoomed in on the sprinkler, it was a pendant sprinkler, so you're not going to have an discussion, but can you add an discussion at the sprinkler? To where when you're picking the list, it will it'll create an entire list of material you need. The the sprinklers are based on their part numbers, and many of them like the redo. Um, let me think. The uh, semi concealed pendant heads they yep. actually come in with a cup uh, that's visible. The 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 I don't want to call it a cover plate. But it's that, you know, it's that recessed cup. Discussion. Yep. Okay. So, yes, I've seen those. And it depends on the sprinkler family. Okay. Um, if the sprinkler family includes that. But, for example, if it was a, a the old 401 style canopy, which nobody right. uses, I don't think. Uh, or a <laughs> true concealer. Uh, I don't believe that the software is currently building the full-blown concealed cup and cover plate with a sprinkler inside. Um, I'd have to double check that because I, I have a tendency to just stick with pretty basic heads when I'm when I'm doing what I do. Doing your model. Yeah, that's fair. Um, but but whatever whatever is in our database is going to show up because Everything that our family builder makes is actually coming out of the SpringCAD database. So that's another point I would drive home, is that it's not just Tyco parts that are in this database. You can add anybody's parts into our database, and you can build that family from anybody's parts. Okay. Now, there is a caveat. I want to be plain about this. Part of what you see when I look at a, an elbow uh, zoomed in close to an elbow here. There's a, there's a sweep and there are a couple of cylinders. Uh, those three pieces make up the model of that elbow, along with all the revet pieces that go into uh, play, the, the connectors and things like that. But a sprinkler head is a much more complex model. As mm -hmm. you can see, there, there are multiple little bits and pieces if i were to take this out and break it apart explode it repeatedly look inside the family you'd see that there's all kinds of pieces involved so if you go to make somebody else's valve somebody else's sprinkler head a sprinkler head with that escutcheon full-blown uh, uh, concealed canopy you'd have to spend some time in my database building those individual pieces. But once they're built and they're in there, then you can build families and use them all over. Away or, you go. Or simpler is uh, let the program do what I just did and then come over here, grab all those sprinkler heads and switch out the families. Right. Because it is a sprinkler family. It's connected to the fitting. It knows everything it needs to know about itself. So at that point, I would say, well, there are simpler Revit tools to do what you and I just talked about. How um, how have you noticed as a designer the change from, say, I won't say pad and paper, but say paper and pen, pencil drawings? Um, you said you started designing in what what year did you say you started designing in? in 1980 with uh, yeah, that's with what a I thought you said, but I didn't want to yeah. be a, I didn't want to be a can yeah, say that. No, I'm, <laughs> I'm that old. Yes. <laughs> Uh, I was born in 88. That's cool. Um, the, uh... Well, I, you know, to be true, I, I started in the womb. So. Oh, well, I'm a, so I'm a third generation sprinkler fitter. If you, uh, you cut my arm right here, you're going to get sprinkler water that comes out of it, right? That's just, you get black sprinkler water. That's the way it yes. works. <laughs> How big of a change is it to go from pen and paper drawings 
to software like this that can kind of sense the ideas that you're thinking in your head and kind of create that product for you? Well, I I transitioned to CAD in the late 80s. Okay. Um, I started in on, on computer hydraulics back in like 84, 83. Um, and then the the AutoCAD side, I, I actually worked for uh, the Grinnell company uh, out in Los Angeles, and we started out on a program called um, GDS, and okay. then that became Micro GDS, and then and then I got into AutoCAD. Uh, so I started working with SprintCAD in about 1995, I think it was. Um, that sounds wrong, but yeah, maybe it was as early as '94, and 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 I I learned then, but I'd already learned the advantage of being able to use that computer to do arrays. Uh, the whole concept of erasing through the mylar was right. was gone, and trust me, I had I had worn out a few eraser shields in my time, <laughs> so uh, I really loved the transition to CAD. Uh, I did not ever want to go back. To drawing circles, as I called it. Sure. Then I spent all these years uh, in '96. I started working for Sprint CAD. I've been with them, you know, ever since. I moved to Philadelphia in 2001, uh, and I've been here in in that vicinity ever since. Um, the transition to Revit, I think, was tougher than trying to learn AutoCAD. Sure. Yeah. I, I find a lot of people that I talk to about doing it is, um, and, and talking to older people as well, is they find going from this, uh, this little tool, which is like the circle square kind of tracer that you use for, for drawn sprinklers by hand, if you ever do. Um, they found the transition from pen and paper to computers substantially easier than going from AutoCAD to Revit. And that's, mm -hmm. I would say, probably 95% of the people are having that harder time. Um, the people that are the most successful with transitioning to Revit have completely deleted the old software off the computer uh, and not used it as a crutch. Uh, a previous guest that I've on, uh, had on, Steve Frederick, it was the first person to say that. And then since I've talked to him, multiple people have said, I just kept going back to the crutch of AutoCAD <laughs> and whatever was or, the yeah. AutoCAD software that I was comfortable with. So I had to I had to delete it in order to make myself. Oh, do I re-download everything so I can get this drawing out, or do I just just learn to use the damn program that I have loaded right now? I I think I'm I'm in much of that same place because all of my Revit experience has been in this environment of trying to create these tools that emulate an easier way to do things. Now, I really right. do feel like like what we're doing is so much easier than the Revit approach. Um, as an example, if you've ever had to draw arm overs, uh, goosenecks from a sprinkler head to a branch line and using straight Revit, the first thing you learn is that the, the, the piping that comes up out of that sprinkler head wants to be the same diameter as your sprinkler head or uh, thread size and mm -hmm. you've got to flip that over so we that was one of the very first things we solved we said oh this is crazy why should we have to change that pipe size so we came up with that ability to say when i draw this gooseneck i want one inch schedule 40 pipe right here right um, other things uh, even like this designing in the 3d view um, having to create sections in order to do certain vertical things was very onerous to us mm -hmm. as as a bunch of AutoCAD guys uh, and so when we created these tools we said well why shouldn't I be able to do these things in any view you know up right. is up down is down left and right so um, I just switched out this piece of pipe and I wanted to point out the fact that that you know just like Revit I see this pipe as an individual piece between these two threaded fittings and right. I just told the system that this was a piece of two and a half inch schedule. Well, actually I didn't call it schedule 10. I called it standard pipe. So if I run that same material summary process, which by the way, the material summary call is exactly like the call for the stock list. The only difference is that my stock list report screen doesn't pop up on me. So everything that you see me doing here 
in order to run this process is exactly the same for generating a Sprinkhead stock list. And anybody that's familiar with Sprinkhead and the stock list process knows that it's all very responsive to those uh, strategies. And we brought those strategies essentially right straight across into the Revit offering. All right, so I'm just telling the program that this two and a half inch pipe that I just created is schedule 10 two inch, two and a half. And the uh, the one inch schedule 40 pipe that was on the system is indeed one inch schedule 40. And I run that. And then when I close and update that, the big difference here is now I've got to build a couple of more families. So the program kicks in, says it's mm -hmm. going to build some families. How easy is the transition? Like when you're, when you're, um, let's say you've got a system laid out like this line that you're working on right now, how easy is it to switch the entire thing from a uh, cast iron threaded um, thread family to say groovelets or mechanical tees or anything like that? Is it just a matter of switching that family over and then it'll update the model automatically or is it? No, it's actually, I would say easier than that. Uh, right. the, the fact is that when, when you go into your strategy, so uh, up on my uh, sprint cat, I've, I've got the um, uh, hiding here from me. I've got my design areas, my job info button. Uh, job info and it's actually reproduced uh, across here somewhere else when I jump into the strategy screen all I have to do is say that uh, this kind of pipe likes to have welded outlets okay. or mechanical tees so the difference between mechanical tees and welded outlets is that simple uh, what I did up on screen now you'll see that the program just there turned that branch line into a single piece of pipe it inserted the coupling that breaks the pipe why because it's two and a half inch schedule 10 it wants to have welded outlets it wants to be, I, and it wants to be grooved yeah right right and if i had told the program to use mechanical tees you'd see a mechanical t here instead of that pipe alette. and so it inserts the couplings for me uh and and the reason that it put the couplings where it did was the program knows to put the long end of the pipe at the end of the run and work back toward the starting point. And earlier I told the program to start everything from down at this end. So uh, in terms of ductile iron versus, um, let's say cast iron, that's a mm -hmm. slightly different question because in both cases, the Sprinkhead strategy says, I like to have threaded fittings. Mm -hmm. the, con the concept with, the f with our family, uh, I'm sorry, the concept behind our connection strategies is that the pipe talks to the fitting. If I tell the pipe that it likes to have threaded endpoints, then when it reaches a fitting, it's telling that fitting, I need a threaded outlet from you. Mm -hmm. And if two pipes meet at a 90 and they both want to be threaded, that's a threaded 90. That's right. Yep. Now, in the database, there are a series of preferred check marks where you can say when the program wants a one inch threaded 90 degree elbow i like that ductile iron piece right there by part number by takeout you can say oh no i want to use these malleable iron fittings or i want to use this short radius groove 90 from some other manufacturer uh, it, right. as long as you go into your database and specify when looking for a fitting of this geometry with these end preps and these sizes, you say, I like that one, then the program will use it whenever you call for that stock list material summary. And you can save lists of preferred items. So maybe, maybe you're a consultant or a designer for hire, and you've got three different companies you work for. These guys like mechanical tees. These guys like pipe alettes and ductile iron fittings. And those guys use somebody else's uh, non tyco product. We right. won't work with them. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we'll, we support we'll it. Tell them where to go. That's yeah, right. That's it. right. As long as they buy it from, the, from our distributor. Okay. Yeah, there um, you go. <laughs> um, 
but whatever you want as your standards, you just tell the database, this is the way I like it, and save that setup. Every time you use that setup, the program's going to draw from those fittings. And it's going to work off of that. How, um, another thing that I know SprintCat has in, in JCI is is kind of the owner of the, uh, kind of one of the most sought after pieces of technology in fire protection design is the fluid delivery time. All right. So I'm going to see if I can real quickly pull up a fluid delivery time situation to show you. I'll go with sure. a standard, uh, just arm over and drop here. Um, no, as a matter of fact, this might as well have some fun. Yeah. Gooseneck uh, it because you're going to have to have it on a dry system anyways. Right. Okay. And uh, so I'm going to basically say, now these these items that you see, this this screen remembers what I did earlier in the session. Um, right. So if these are still set to one inch standard. Uh, my segment B vertical offset uh, is a foot from the pipe. I'm not going to go to the sprinklers. And now be this particular item, it says, okay, what's your minimum arm over length and what's your maximum arm over length? So I'm going to bump this down to two feet. I'm going to tell it that the branch line, the actual branch line that we're going to create wants to be one foot higher than the main. And I actually okay. have an option here that I, I could reference the mains level. That's a, a Revit level. So if you had a sloping main, but you wanted all your branch lines to be at nine foot nine, then I could say, I want my branch lines to be nine foot nine above the main pipes level. And then every riser nipple would be a different length. Um, branch to main connection, inch and a half. Okay, so I'm gonna run this. I'm gonna grab a bunch of sprinklers. Now I'm I'm running this in the uh, fine mode as opposed to if I was running it in course, I could see those sprinkler heads. But basically I grab the sprinklers, I grab the main, and I get this image that shows me this is how they're going to get routed. And I might look at this and say, well, I don't really like some of this. I'm gonna I'm gonna increase my maximum arm over length to three feet and refresh that and I get a slightly different layout. Or I want to flip those arm overs over to the other side of things. It's kind of arbitrary when they're all broken up like this, mm -hmm. but if it was a very regular system and you just wanted everything on the left side, et cetera, that would you know, that be more meaningful. So I run that. It takes a couple seconds to draw all those sure. pipes. And basically what you've just done is highlighted a wing of a building and kind of asked, I mean, yeah, you, I, I select a bunch of, I select a bunch of sprinklers. Yeah, you made it draw the piping. I got the all the branch lines. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and you know what? You said the most efficient way, and I want to be fair. The program can only understand so much of what is or is not efficient. There comes a point where you're going to have to modify a few branch lines and move things, but Revit does make that easy. Once the connections are made, it's not hard to slide a branch line over six inches or put a jog around and things like right. that. If uh, if it made the job too easy, you probably wouldn't sell too many because no no <laughs> designer, all the designers would be out of work, right? You'd sell them to the companies and not the designers themselves. All right, so I'm gonna switch over to a, kind of a three-dimensional isometric view and you can see I just basically created all these goosenecks tied into all the branch line mains. What I'm going to do in order to show you that fluid delivery time is I'm going to ask the program to just send this whole system into the Sprint Calc program. Right. So I say uh, mm -hmm. proceed to Sprint Calc. It asks me to map my piping just like any other condition. The program mm -hmm. needs to know, well, what, what exactly kind of pipes are these? Mm -hmm. And again, I'll point out that you could be drawing using somebody else's software. You could be drawing using straight Revit. Um, you could get a drawing from somebody else who draws in straight Revit and has their own pipe types set up. Our program will read them and let you map them to known pipes within our database. So this is four inch schedule 10. Uh, I've got inch and a half schedule 40. I see inch and a quarter schedule 40. 
what a mean designer inch and a half skid 40. <laughs> and then uh oh you don't like that i huh? ah groove it if you can no i'm just kidding yeah I like throwing, well that's I like true you know together. when i started two inch and down was threaded and then over the years that has slowly crept down where yeah. what and i think it was the improvement of groove fittings quite honestly but mm -hmm. groove couplings anyway uh now the program you're, already, now you're even starting to see people not even using like inch and a quarter is almost people aren't using it anymore because oh yeah of, they're just skipping over it just going right to inch and a half yeah yeah uh let's see that's a four inch alarm valve and this is a gate valve so you'll notice i'm able to go up here and do a little sort I, i'm mm -hmm. honestly i'm hoping to improve a couple of these dialogues yet but uh, those things take time we got to kill the big fish first or wait yeah. let's not kill the fish let's catch and release so it's a it's it's like what we're looking at on your screen right now if you're not if you're not watching it or if you haven't shut off the podcast and switched over to youtube yet yeah. is if um you're looking at a video game is essentially the best way of putting it you're looking at a video game and uh i mean boy if we had these video games when i was a kid uh <laughs> You're, you're looking at a video game of a sprinkler system, which is awesome. And uh, so he's just working through creating the files right now for the uh, for the Sprint Calc software right now. So it can kind of go through and get your fluid delivery times. Right. So the Calc program is part of your Revit. So I didn't run a calculation, but if I had basically gone in and said, these are the sprinkler heads that are flowing in design area one, these are the heads that are flowing in design area two. You can insert hoses. Uh, you can specify the source conditions, the, the whole nine yards, uh, standpipes, you, everything, whatever you can do in, in our calc program. You mm -hmm. can do that in Revit, and it'll run those calcs, and you'll get a result. What I did here is I took the system, and I sent it into the calc program, not as individual design areas, but just like send the whole thing in, because fluid delivery time needs the whole system. It needs to know the volume of those pipes in order to understand the compression of the air and the movement of the water through the entire system. Okay. So, so I'm saving this file into my Calc4, I'm gonna call it demo FDT so I can find it later. And, and if I wanted to, I mean, I could right now, I could go in and run calculations in here, but the truth is, it's much easier to perform basic hydraulic calculations right from the Revit interface, right from the CAD interface, as opposed to running Sprint Calc. Even though there are many authorities and insurance companies and people who do run Sprint Calc strictly for hydraulics, uh, for the designer, I'm going to say, no, don't waste your time. Do, do that from your Revit environment. Right. All right. So now I'm going to minimize Revit. So now that I've reopened in the calc software with the fluid delivery time license activated, I can now go in and I can grab a hold of specific sprinkler heads. And uh, I'll just take like these four down here. Mm -hmm. And I'm able to say, let's create a headset. And it says, well, you can't do that for a wet system. All right, so that means I've got to come in here and I've got to take a look at my valve. So it's it's understanding the type of valve you have in order to do the fluid del delivery time. It's seeing that you have a wet valve installed and cannot do a fluid delivery time. Fluids are yeah. there. And, and while that's generally true, yes, the real issue was I had not told this system that it was a dry pipe system oh, because okay. that, that alarm valve is capable of acting as a dry valve. So now I flipped over this other switch that says this is a dry system. And it okay. says, hey, all these things are gonna be updated. And I should now be able to grab a hold of, with my node selection tool, grab a hold of four heads. And I, I say four heads just because the, the standard in fluid delivery time is one, two, or four. And uh, that comes out of UL, and it says, okay, you need a supply node. All right, so now I've got to go down here and grab a hold of that node and tell him that he is of the type source. 
or supply. Now, in order to actually run a fluid delivery time calc, that supply has to have parameters or a, a curve. Right now, that, that's an empty source, uh, but I have the ability to come in here and say, let's just grab a hold of a pump that I have in my database. Uh, so horizontal split case. And, and you know, it really doesn't matter which pump I grab right here. Obviously, a user is going to pick something meaningful. But what matters is that I now have this flow curve that represents the power of my source at that point. And I say, OK, and back out. Let's see if I can actually get a fluid delivery time calc started now. Node selection tool, grab four heads and tell it I want a new headset. And it says that you don't have a dry pipe valve. All right, so my bad. So now I've got to come in, take a closer look at that valve. So this is where it'll be able to tell you, no, you can't, that's a wet system. Yeah. Or a wet valve, yeah. Okay. All right. So now I'm in here and I have to specifically tell the program it's a dry pipe valve. And so looking, alarm valve. Now somebody out there, such as Derek Tyler, is right now screaming into the <laughs> radio, you know, or the computer. It's right there. It's right, right there. there. Uh, uh, subtype alarm valve 52. I, f I know that I got that wrong and I'm looking for, it's not the a dry generic. pipe valve family or. Yeah. Yeah. It's here somewhere. Come on, baby. Now this is where I count on you, Chris, to actually edit out all this. Oh, nasty. no problem looking around stuff yeah am i on the wrong part i don't as, think so as far as anybody knows valve. it's going to go right from then i got to click here and select dry <laughs> pipe valve and then that's right. where it'll go ball valve gate valve pressure relief alarm valve well, i'll be darn hmm what did i do wrong here All right, tell you what, I'll bet the issue is right here. Hydraulic group. Yes. GPV. Yep, there you go. All right. So I have to tell my valve that it is indeed a dry pipe valve. And then I can pick a specific device and the program will offer me this list of dry pipe valves. So I'm going to grab hey, one go. uh, DPV and I, I just grab one at random here. I'm a bad salesman. Um, the DPV-1 is probably one of the best dry pipe valves out there. Okay, good job. That's not me just, that's not me just kissing uh, JCI's <laughs> rear okay. end. One of my favorite dry pipe valves. I, you know, it's, <laughs> I'm, I'm terrible because I'm such a sprint CAD oriented guy. I'm always, I've got my head in how the program works. I just don't pay a lot of attention to product and mm -hmm. I probably shouldn't admit that with, you know, people from product on the line but what are you gonna do <laughs> all right it's okay so, we got him muted we got him muted it's fine yeah. <laughs> now you know uh this is a dry pipe valve i accidentally picked a three inch valve that's okay i have to specify a trip ratio because fluid delivery time is very interested in how long does it take that valve to open based on the gas pressure in the system, based on the volume of gas in the system, based on how many orifices open up at a given moment. And of course, that's all covered by NFPA 13 and the UL listings and stuff like that that tell you how many heads you have to open under certain conditions. Is it a residential system? Is it commercial? Is it et cetera? Right. There's also optional accelerators that can be activated, such as our electronic uh, electronic accelerator and other 
companies have similar devices, so that as the air begins to bleed out of the out of the system, instead of waiting for that air pressure to drop to the point where the clapper, quote unquote, releases due to the difference in the pressure under the clapper versus over the clapper, you can have a device that says, hey, I sense an air pressure loss. And there are various ways to define those devices based on manufacturer and, and model. But essentially what it does then is it, it allows the valve to open sooner. Right. So you have, you have pressurized water entering the system and the gas pressure in the system has not gone down as much. And that's one of the things that this program actually taught people that they didn't expect is that having more gas pressure in the system wouldn't slow the water from entering the system. It would actually limit the amount of water that moves into the non-active portions of the system oh, because okay. you get this air pressure buffer. Right. So with a, higher, with a higher pressure, you have more air in the lines that are not discharging Right, right, yeah. and so that that funnels the water into the more important areas of the system right. that much more quickly. Now, ha having said that, everything is subject to specifics of the the topology of the system and and you know the actual layout and how much of this and how many feet of that. Yep. But that was a general rule that a lot of people didn't expect when they implemented this software. Uh, okay, so now I've modified that pipe's properties. Uh, valve, I should say, and I'm going to come up here and tell the program I really, really, really want to make a new headset, and it does. And based on some defaults, I can come in and change these, but the program says, okay, you got a bunch of 5.6k factor heads, and the operating pressure is set for 7.2 psi. Okay. When I go to run a calculation, I have a trip time a delivery time and an operating time. So trip is how long does it take for the valve to open? Right. Delivery is how long did it take for the valve to open and for the water to get to the operating sprinklers, which is basically where the inspector clicks the stopwatch. And right. then we have this third feature, which is how long does it take the pressure to reach full operating value at all of your sprinkler heads. So it could take a few extra seconds for the mm -hmm. back pressure to build up and, and everything operating at full capacity. Uh, I've got questions like, what's the gas pressure? So I'm going to drop in, you know, 15 PSI. Um, I won't go down this road of discussion, but there are some who say that low air pressure systems are better because, et cetera. Um, I'm just going to say that that's not always true. You mm -hmm. really need to run, in fact, I'll say I don't think it's very often true personally, but you need to run the calculations and really prove out under your water pressure conditions, under your system layout, under you know the possible valve types and system that you might install, what's going to operate. You'll see that there's also a gas temperature because the actual air pressure, air temperature has an impact on how quickly that air can escape through the open orifices. Uh, there's a monitoring time, required delivery time. I'll leave those go. And I'm going to say, I don't have an accelerator. And I'm just going to basically run that. And it says, hey, your gas pressure is too low to hold back that. Now, I told the program that my valve had a 5.5 .5 differential trip ratio. I didn't bother to look at how strong my source was. So I'm just going to bump the gas pressure up a couple of times. I bumped it up to 25 PSI, calculations completed successfully. And if I look at my summary, it'll tell me that it took 1.7 seconds for that dry pipe valve to operate. And then, right. so now going back, how do you get the water delivery? All right, so basically I click that button right there and I run it again. And the program's done. And now I can look at that summary and it says, okay, Took 1.7 to trip, and it took another seven and a half seconds for this water to hit H13 or head number 13. Wow! And, and then the the last one would be to run the operating pressure if you if you care about that. But if I run the analysis screen, 
what you're seeing here are up to six important points in the overall system. Top left is the source. The next one to the right is the dry pipe valve. And then we have these four sprinkler heads. So at the source, the red line is my pressure. The source pressure was about 105 pounds static. And it held there for that 1.7 seconds. And then it dropped down to somewhere between 40 and 50 PSI. And then the pressure slowly starts to climb. And you'll see a little dip, or I should say a, a jump in the in the pressure as the water begins to equalize into the system. For those mm -hmm. first, what is that, about half of a second to one second, that water is just rushing in as fast as it can get past that valve. Then yeah. you start to get back pressure. So same thing with the blue line is water. There's no flow until the clapper opens, then a whole lot of water, and then it slowly begins to decline. In fact, what I'm gonna do is I'm, I'm gonna close this and run one more. I'm going to run the operating because that has more interesting graphs. Take a look at the analysis. So now what we saw before was only the first seven or eight seconds and everything stopped. Right. Now we have all the way out to about 16, 17 seconds at which point, and you can see on the sprinkler head charts, top right and bottom three, as the air pressure and the water flow, they all equalize out. And you see those little wiggles? Mm -hmm. That's the air pressure acting on those dead end portions of the system. And you get that water coming in and pressures are balancing, equalizing, till you get a very steady condition. Is that the water stabilizing, like water pressure stabilizing as well? That's when you get your peak yes. flow and, okay. Yes. and. And if I uh, close this and I, I run uh, this little movie, then we can actually watch the water run into the system. So I'll hit play and it splits, splits again, and it hits those four heads. And now you see the water continuing to push in and fill portions of the system over those many seconds. Now, yeah. the program, and, everything, ahead. Everything from the moment the water hit the heads right about here on out, this would be considered fluid delivery time, 7.3 mm -hmm. seconds. The rest of that time is, did the pressure stay above the minimum pressure for a total of 10 seconds? That's Those are the defaults built into the system. Okay. I, I've worked with people where they had to uh, extend that out further to give the program more time to equalize and set out the pressure because of you know crazy large systems or whatever reason. Uh, but what's interesting is is as I move the mouse between the uh, or move the cursor between the seven and the seventeen, you can see how things are kind of expanding and contracting. Right, it's a little slower here in our in our view than when I'm running it all by itself. But that's basically water pressure building at the heads, mm -hmm. uh, the pressure is equalizing, and uh, you know all that extra piping and air acting as a buffer to the pressure buildup. And awesome. that's fluid delivery time. That's fluid delivery time. And and let me point out that the real yeah. advantage of fluid delivery time, in my opinion, I, I think it's a fantastic program because it can save the contractor so much money. Absolutely. Not, on, not only in the concept of I know it's going to work before I go out there and, and pull that flow test, but also the fact that by standard thinking, people used to put in three, four, five dry pipe valves where they can now come in and put in just two or three. Right. And the amount of money saved on the valve and the labor, honestly, you have to wonder why did, you know, Johnson Controls make this piece of software because it's losing them money. Yeah. But it does <laughs> it does work to the advantage of the industry. It's a, And it's an awesome uh, – thank you for showing me that. If somebody wants to come on and uh, do a trial or learn more about the fluid delivery time or SprintCAD itself, where do they go for more information? Uh, SprintCAD.com is the web page. And right up across the top in the right corner is a big orange button that says sales slash demo. And 
pretty much all product requests, all information requests. You click that button, it brings you to a page that says, if you're in you know, the Americas, use this email address. If you're in Asia Pacific, use this email address. If you're in Europe and Middle East. So you, you click on the appropriate email address and just write the email and explain what you want. I, I mentioned at the very beginning that we'd love to have feedback from people that are designing in Revit and feel the need for specialized tools that meet their needs. I, I've found that there's not there are not so many people designing in Revit that it's easy for me to get feedback on mm -hmm. what's what's next. What do you really need? Uh, one good question is, you know, how important is it? Uh, we we do hangers, but I've I've been thinking it'd be nice to have some automated hanger routine. So I'd love to hear what are your pain points, what are your needs in that Revit environment. Use that email link and just in there indicate somewhere like, uh, you know, request, feature request, Revit, and then explain what you're looking for and somebody will get back to you. Thanks for showing me the Sprint CAD for Revit. Uh, My pleasure. A lot yeah, I wish I'd know. have been able to even show you more of the tools because there's so many cool tools in here, but uh, we got carried away. That'll be for another episode. I'd love it. Awesome. Thanks again. Thank you. Hey, everyone. This episode of the Fire Sprinkler Podcast is done. If you like this episode, leave a review, comment, or hop over to my social media pages and let me know. Just search Fire Sprinkler Podcast on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or LinkedIn. Don't forget to hashtag Fire Sprinkler Podcast and anything you think I should know about or see. If you have any suggestions for future episodes of the Fire Sprinkler Podcast, email info at firesprinklerpodcast.com. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. Take care.